So I'm Dr. Keltner. I'm a professor of psychology here, and I'm also the executive director of the Greater Good Science Center. And I'd like to thank Tom and Ruth Ann Hornaday, who are the uh, founders of the center here at Berkeley. About seven years ago, they came to Berkeley and uh, provided us with a gift with the intention to take the best science of compassion and altruism and all the good stuff about human nature and uh, develop that science and then promote it and disseminate it um, as best we could. And what we do at the Greater Good Science Center is uh, we have a surly group of fellows uh, from several different disciplines, graduate and undergraduate fellows. Some of them are here tonight. We put out a magazine that Jason uh, Marsh and Jeremy Smith edit, uh, Greater Good, and we have a new issue out on trust that Paul and his daughter Eve contributed to. Um, we have a very vibrant and active website that is disseminating the science of compassion uh, to parents and educators, literally to hundreds of thousands of people out there. Uh, it's an idea whose time has come uh, and where there's a lot of hunger. Thank you, Tom and Ruthann, for making this kind of evening possible. It's a great pleasure. Um, it is very hard to introduce Paul Ekman, who is my mentor. And without Paul, uh, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. And you wouldn't be sitting here tonight because his science is uh, the foundation of what we're doing at the Greater Good Science Center. Uh, about over 40 years ago, Paul hopped on a plane, went to New Guinea, uh, and tested a radical hypothesis that human emotion is universal to the human species. Um, and it was a, a uh, paradigm-shifting study that radically altered uh, our science. It led people to think about other cultures, it led people to read Darwin, it led people to think about the evolution of human emotion as a foundation of human nature. Uh, and the effects of Paul's science uh, cannot be appreciated uh, the extent to which they are. I had an undergrad come to me today, uh, yesterday, a couple days ago in my office hours, and said, Paul Ekman is my Lord and Savior. Uh, <laughs> I was like, great, I'm not Paul Ekman, but uh, uh, when we have new insights about the role of emotion in marriage. That's thanks to Paul Ekman's important work. When we have new treatments of autistic children and depression that is founded in Paul Ekman's work uh, that started in New Guinea 40 years ago. When we learn about the emotional brain and the, the gut feelings that we have that guide us toward right and wrong, things like compassion, that is thanks to Paul Ekman's work. I could go on and on. Uh, he has changed how we think about human beings um, for the scientists who have been privileged to work with Paul, like I did as a postdoc, um, the thing that astonishes you is that Paul uh, is not constrained by the confines of his discipline or his paradigms or the lab, uh, the science that he's working in. He uh, transcends those boundaries. He's an accomplished photographer who's shown in museums. He's an accomplished writer. His work has influenced uh, legal policy uh, on down the line. It's a stunning uh, array. Paul has brought, uh, had two great conversations, I believe, in his, his life, uh, alongside with his family. Um, and uh, one is with Charles Darwin, and he's brought Charles Darwin to our public awareness. And today, when everybody learns about Charles Darwin throughout American universities, we can, and universities throughout the world, Paul was a part of that. The second one is what we'll hear about tonight, which is Paul's remarkable engagement with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, and uh, an engagement that's been uh, going on for several years now, uh, involved a lot of powerful experiences for Paul uh, and many scientists who have the privilege of being close to the Dalai Lama. And it involves a synthesis of Darwin-inspired Western thinking about emotion and then the 2,000 years of wisdom from Tibetan Buddhism, which is an astonishing epistemology of the nature of emotion. Uh, and Paul is here to talk about those experiences represented in his new book, Emotional Awareness. Uh, Paul has given us a vocabulary of emotion, and I can't, I don't think you've yet described the emotion I feel to introduce you. <laughs> but it's a, a reverence and gratitude. So thank you, Paul, for being here. Thank you very much, Dr. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, no. okay. Yeah. There you go. Uh, there's supposed to be a mic, but I don't think the mic works. Um, so. That's just for the camera. 
The mic is just for the camera. You see the nature of the society we live in. We live just reverence over people. Uh, I'll stand. I think you may hear me better if I stand. And if I start to sink into my usual conversational mumble, just shut up and I'll try to speak louder. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. Uh, actually, the emotion that the Dalai Lama suggested, and what you're talking about is discussed in one of the chapters, I can't remember which one, but he suggested that we use the term to rejoice. And with that, really gratitude, but rejoicing is more appropriate. But that's another old story, other than the one I want to tell tonight. I should also mention that that New Guinea work that uh, Dr. mentioned, for those of you who are old enough to know, I remember the name Senator Proxmire. I got a golden fleece from Senator Proxmire for wasting the taxpayers' money studying the expressions of savages in New Guinea. <laughs> Proxmire is a smart man, but that whole golden fleece was a cheap shot uh, against really basic research. And uh, there are many reasons for regretting that he didn't live a long life, one of them being that he couldn't get to see how much of that research is now being used by different parts of our government. Any of you who write know that you live in hope for the moment that your editor will say, don't change a word. <laughs> My first book was published in 72. But it is only with this book that my editor said it about the first paragraph of the introduction. So I feel I must read it to you. <laughs> Emotions unite and divide the worlds in which we live both personal and global, motivating the best and worst of our actions. They save our lives, enabling quick action in emergencies. Yet how we behave when we are emotional can make our lives and the lives of those we care about miserable. Without emotions, there would be no heroism, empathy, or compassion, but neither would there be cruelty selfishness, nor spite. Bringing different perspectives to bear, Eastern and Western, spirituality and science, Buddhism and psychology, the Dalai Lama and I sought to clarify these contradictions and illuminate some paths that might enable a balanced emotional life and a feeling of compassion that can reach across the globe. We first met about 18 months ago, it was our first one-to-one -one meeting. We first met eight years ago, and we were at a number of small scientific meetings, but then decided that we would try to clarify these issues in a series, but well, we didn't know it would be a series. We thought it would be one face-to-face -face conversation for 12 hours over the course of three days, and my wife sitting here in front former dean of your graduate division, and my lovely daughter sitting here, and my son all sat in as silent observers in that meeting. Now, any of you who know my wife know that it was a growth experience for her. <laughs> Such challenges are the essence of life. Uh, our second meeting was a year later for three hours. And our third meeting was three months after that for 25 hours, so a total of 40 hours of one-on-one -on -one conversation. I had never spent that much time talking with anyone about a single set of issues again and again and again. Now, I probably talked to you for more than 40 hours. And I think you were was it two or three years you were across the But it was intermittent, and it wasn't really the same issue. It was different issues. Well, that's the cover of the book, and you can see, he's just told me a joke. <laughs> and, uh, he has that puckish look in his face, <laughs> as he's enjoying the fact that I'm breaking up. You'll see, I was able to get him to break up, too. 
Uh, the book is not text, it's a dialogue. And it's presented as the dialogue, just reorganized temporarily by topic, with very little editing. Uh, Richard Gere and I have just done an audio book of it. And I couldn't get Gear to read my part so I could read the Dalai Lama. <laughs> but he was upset because if you've read any of the books by the Dalai Lama, they're totally fluent English. But that's not how he speaks. They've all been highly edited and polished. Here, and actually I'm going to play you so you can actually hear, you'll hear how he talks. You can understand it, obviously not his first language, but he speaks with passion and force, and I believe that gets lost when you polish the prose, and so I tried to preserve it in the book. We discussed seven obstacles to emotional balance, seven things that stand in our way, and from a Buddhist and from a Western point of view, what can we do to remove those obstacles? That's about the first third. Then there's a wonderful chapter called Anger, Resentment, and Hatred. <laughs> so needy. <laughs> and yet there are really important differences among those three uh, that we need to understand that have both personal and political uh, implications. There's a discussion of forgiveness. I'm going to play, play you a small part of that. Two chapters on compassion and the last chapter on personal transformation. So I'm going to give you a chance to hear some of our conversation. Uh, I'll pick up after each audio excerpt, and then I'm going to uh, talk a bit about compassion, some of the ideas that emerged in my discussion with him. I'll tell you how he responded to it, but I've been elaborating it. Uh, each time I give a talk and talk about compassion, I get some new ideas. And I'm actually now trying to schedule still another meeting with him, because there are three or four issues that have now become salient in my mind about compassion that I'd like to explore with him. You would think after 40 hours, we would have had enough. But in the 40th hour, and I said, we're done, which turns out we really are. He said, no more, no more. He was right, I was wrong. There was more. We just didn't get to it. So, someone told me ahead of time that if he ever leans back in his seat, time is up. <laughs> <laughs> and I never, my back never touched the chair, nor did this. Uh, this is from our second meeting in April of 2007. Now, if I have choice, then if I act in a way that harms others, mm. why do you forgive me for doing so? I could have chosen not to. Mm. I will answer. If you uh, keep that sort of first day, uh, crutch, uh, crutch, or yes. I don't know, crutch, <laughs> <that's good. laughs> uh, if you keep crutch, then you will get more suffering. Yes. If you give forgiveness, then you feel more, more, so more relieved. Oh, so it's good for you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's good for the person who forgives, but does it not remove responsibility? No, no, for example, I, I think, for example, now we uh, mentally give forgiveness to the Chinese. Yes. Hmm? That means we try to, as well, try to develop or try to keep uh, negative feeling towards them yes. because of their, because of their wrong deeds. Yes. But that does not mean we accepted what what they done. Yes. So 
very spiritual forgiveness against them as far as their action is concerned. Explain a little more. I'm just on the edge of understanding. Oh, that forgiveness, I feel, means not forget what they've done. But forgiveness means do not keep your negative feeling towards them. So as far as that action is concerned, sometimes you, you, your intelligence, you deliberately have to take countermeasure, but without a negative feeling. Can you take it away from the Chinese for a moment? <laughs> whoever it is, oh. if they act in a harmful fashion, mm -hmm. or they had free choice, and they chose to act in that way, you forgive them, but do you also condemn their action? Oh, yes. 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 It's a wrong action. Yes. An unethical, immoral yes. action. If your side is honest. Yes. Then must must uh, uh, criticize. This, I think, is what is in the West misunderstood about the Buddhist view. They believe that the forgiving means yes. you don't have hold them responsible mm. for having acted wrongly. Mm. If you don't mm. hold them responsible, how will they learn and change? That's right. Oh, that's, that's right. That's right. Usually, you think uh, uh, I make that's all that. Uh, distinction. After action. Yes. Huh? yes. Action is concerned, you have to oppose. Yes. You have to stop. You yes. have to try to stop. Yes. Even a uh, bit uh, harsh method. Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, but as far as actor is concerned, yes. you should <laughs> not develop negative feeling. Yes. And you should keep more compassion. Now well, that we we ourselves, you see, we often do that when I made something mistake to you. Then later I have to later uh, I, I I will say say because some kind of confess oh, confession right? Yes. Oh, because I didn't just, uh, oh, that's, oh, that's I apologize. I apologize. So that time I made distinction. I myself now feel that's wrong, wrong action. But wrong action, you never ask, you never, because still you believe that wrong action is wrong, that action is wrong. Okay, very important. Huh? Very so important. I recognize that action is wrong, but that does not mean I still, I'm doing that. So I, because of that, I said it, I apologize. This moment, I need distinction. My previous action and myself. If I accept your apology, mm. then I'm recognizing that you and your action are not identical. Then I didn't remember. Yes, that's right. And so this leads us right into the heart of anger. Mm. Because when you wrote about this, mm. when I first read it, I think in Ethics for Millennium, you said that you use force to stop the action mm. and compassion for the actor. Yes. That, I believe, is a description of constructive anger, mm. which means that if we accept your view of that, we then have to say anger can be constructive. As you look to. Yes. Yes, you agree. Uh, now here, you see that anger towards that action. Yes. Not the person. It doesn't try to hurt the yes. person. Yes, yes. That's how they are. Oh. Towards person, towards actor, compassion. Yes. Towards action, anger. Even from a practical viewpoint, oh. leave aside everything else, mm. they'll never change if you try to hurt them. Mm. Only if you have compassion for them. Oh, yes. Will they stop acting that's right. in a harmful way? That's right. So, just if you didn't have any concern for ethics, just for practical consequences, mm -hmm. this is the right track. Yes. Very good. Strong. Very nice words. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 Excuse me? Yes. Yeah. 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 I learned that when he's ready to take a break, 
he reaches for his shoes. And sometimes you can stretch it out another five or ten minutes, but that's really the point at which he needs to get up. Watching the debates, I noted that Joe Biden gave us an example of Buddhist anger. When halfway through his opening, he talked about John McCain. And he started by saying, John is my friend. I like John, and I've known him for decades. And then, each time he condemned with force, with anger and action, he used the word John, not McCain, to remind us. So he said, but John's policies on Medicare are ruinous. John's this will hurt us. So anger at the action, but continuing to maintain the regard for him as a person. I hope someday I can find out whether uh, Biden has done any Buddhist readings. Those of you who remember Richard Lazarus, <clears throat> this time I'm getting him. Uh, Richard Lazarus uh, was a professor at this university in psychology uh, for many, most of his career, 90% uh, of his career. He died about five or six years ago. And in his book on emotion, he gave exactly the same idea about focusing your anger at the action, not at the person. And I know he had not done reading in Buddhism, but it's no surprise. Smart people, they look at the same species, are going to come up with some of the same ideas. Not unique. Now, the Dalai Lama was told by a neuroscientist, Francisco Varela, who's no longer alive, that compassion is an emotion, and so that's what he accepted. I was able to convince him that it is not an emotion. So we have fundamental differences. I consider emotion, because compassion is kind of emotion. Oh, it is my job. And by the end of the day, you'll see it. So since I, uh, since I have to mean that it has become like an emotion, it's become a part of you. Mm -hmm. It is now, comes out whenever there is the occasion. Yes. Is that what you mean? You say you were. That's when an emotion comes in. I felt emotion is something, a certain mental state, mm -hmm. which now you feel very strongly. Okay. Oh. So the negative side also, you see, the uh, and uh, attachment, very strong, strong degree. Then, you see, the, your the physical, also you see some changing. Uh, and feel very strongly. So that same experience, the compassion. Yes. But the difference is, the other is more or less spontaneously come. Uh, and from Buddhist viewpoint, much lit with ignorance. Uh, this, like compassion, this infinite compassion, unbiased compassion. This is, is it only through training, through reasoning. Through special effort, and once you have experience, uh, once you, see, you uh, reach high degree of that experience, then same, same sort of effect on physical or physiological, well, yes. physiological. physiological changes such as goose pimples coming out and tears coming out. So the way I would like to change what you say mm. is that when you reach this stage of infinite unbiased compassion mm. it is like an emotion in that it comes out without effort. Like it comes out no. with okay. strength. That's okay. Is that okay? Yeah. That's okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> the way it's written here, it said, and that's when the emotion comes in, you think, is that when you get angry? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what you mean. That's what I want to make that change. Okay? <laughs> yes. Okay. Now compromise now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 of, of course, uh, our, our knowledge, the emotion is very limited. You know that, huh? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, here, I just want 
not a political decision, but I think anyway, something like the political. The, I, I think since our meeting, I had opportunity to uh, visit uh, some Muslim community uh, in, in, in uh, very near Pakistan border. Pakistan border. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, one religious leader in that community uh, welcomed me and uh, speaks. Then, in his speech, you see, he mentioned we Muslims, uh, we should love not only to human beings, but also to extend all creatures of God or Allah, he mentioned. So they are the Christian lover, Muslim chick lover. So here, um, since there was the mention of the Christianity, yeah. So, so similarly, I will. or similarly, uh, according to Muslim practitioner also, the uh, the emphasis, the Allah or compassion should extend up to entire creatures of Allah. I don't know. I'll put that in. Yes. Huh? I would ask you know, one question. Mm. What about an atheist? Would you extend it to an atheist? It is a true reasoning, true intelligence. <laughs> Sorry about that. So here we talked about how do you learn compassion? In Chicago you said that knowledge can be taught to encourage compassion. Yes. Can that knowledge be learned by reading a book, or must it involve practice? Compassion knowledge, yeah. Compassion. Of course, the compassion is a action, sorry, the mental action, some, some of the charge, It's a mental activity, compassion, yes. Or mental activities. That's what I'm talking about. So it need not necessarily be expressed outside. Yes. Some some kind of mental activities. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, or in other words, I I don't think proper word, but the compassion is a absolutely strong feeling of mind. Uh, without that feeling, just a mere knowledge of mind is such a such a uh, compassion is such a such. such. There's that's not understanding. Uh, no effect. So you must be able to cultivate a very strong. Uh, With which uh, particular practice would you cultivate it? Mm. One our method is say, to see those beings, those sentient beings who are passing through. Uh, Serious of suffering. Now some uh, helpless poor people. When you see that, uh, generally speaking, spontaneously, you see the strong feeling of concern will come. Uh, I, I think, like television, now often showing these uh, violence. Now, for example, the uh, Iraq sort of violence. And that day by day, some people then may become something normal. Right? But often, usually, uh, when these often see, then you, see, you get the feeling, oh, how bad violence, the suicide bombings, how bad. So, so these are, uh, so that, that become something so that uh, limiting, right? Uh, through book, you may learn violence is bad. But then we actually just saw the people suffer uh, as a result of violence. Uh, then you really feel, as a share. So that just seeing the suffering of others will increase, increase your compassion. Yes, that's right.
So now I would like to talk a little bit about the ideas that got developed in the book and afterwards about why compassion is not an emotion. And then I'll go into a taxonomy of empathy. And then I'll finish. So why do I argue that compassion is not an emotion? Uh, emotions can be enacted constructively or destructively, but not compassion. Now, in my very first meeting with him in 2000, I don't know whether you remember, you, you were sitting there, he said to me, he said to me, uh, can compassion ever be destructive? And without thought, I said, gazing out into where the observers were sitting and seeing my daughter sitting there, I said, yes, it can be destructive when out of a worry and concern about your offspring, you don't allow them to have autonomy. You're overprotective because you're so worried that they're going to harm themselves and then they can't grow. So that's destructive compassion. That's an exception. For the most part, although every emotion can be enacted constructively or destructively, not inherent in the nature of any emotion that it's harmful, but it takes some skill to enact it constructively, compassion virtually always is constructive. So that's the first reason. The second is, we don't need to cultivate emotions. They're there. They're part of what's in all human beings, unless there's some rather severe damage uh, in the person. But compassion needs to be cultivated, particularly if it's going to reach beyond your immediate family. A third is that emotions distort perception. I've used the concept of a refractory period, that emotions act as a filter. And when you're in the grip of an emotion, you only see the things that fit and support the emotion. Even what's stored in your memory, you can't remember things that don't fit and feed that emotion. So you have a distorted reality. Now, that's great in terms of focusing attention. It doesn't last more than a few seconds. It gets you in a lot of trouble when it lasts for minutes. But compassion does not distort your perception of the world. Another major difference. Emotions typically occur without awareness. We are not only not aware of the appraisal mechanism that sets off the emotion, even though a lot of psychologists think it's worthwhile to have you fill out questionnaires about why you had this emotion, but you're not a witness to it. Think of the near-miss car accident. That's a mechanism that developed in our ancestral environment for dealing with large animals who suddenly came at us and wanted to eat us. If it wasn't for those saber-toothed tigers, we wouldn't be able to drive on freeways. We'd all be on bicycles. Because right? we wouldn't have this instant, 200 milliseconds, before you are even aware of it, an extremely complex appraisal is made, not just of the danger, but the speed and angle and the adjustments are made. And if you survive, which we usually do, it's only afterwards you realize that you are afraid. Consciousness in my view, emotions evolve to keep consciousness from mucking around with our emotions and interfering. Even when you're acting emotionally, very often we don't realize it. <clears throat> We've all had the experience that someone says to us, what are you so upset about? And that's the first time we realize we're upset. It's not that we're unconscious, we're not in a coma. There's no part of ourself that is observing ourself and therefore, we can regulate and choose how to enact emotions unless we can introduce awareness. That's why we call the book Emotional Awareness. It's the key. No emotion regulation without awareness. And nature doesn't make it easy for you to gain awareness of the impulse before the action or the action as it's occurring. When you're acting compassionately, you're always aware of it. So, another big difference. Only two more. Emotions can be out of control. 
I'm not the only one I think who's had the experience of saying, gee, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. Do you know there's now an email service that you can purchase that when you send the email, it goes to them, and you have X number of minutes to pull it back. <laughs> Why do you need that? It's because with email, you get out of control. And you say things you wish you hadn't said. And you do things. Now, Don and I makes a very interesting point, and that is you can get words out faster than you can get actions mobilized. So we're much more likely for our regrettable behaviors to be words, unforgivable, maybe, close, and of course, not to the Dalai Lama. There's a wonderful cartoon that's in the book where a woman from the New Yorker is looking at her husband with strong disregard, I'll use a general term, and he says, well, the Dalai Lama didn't have to put up with your whining. <laughs> He points out that really, uh, he doesn't know anything about marriage. I was at a meeting, a large public meeting, and one of the people in the audience said to him, uh, tell me, Your Holiness, how can I raise my child to be compassionate? He said, why ask me? I don't have children. <laughs> <laughs> the emotions can last for as little as a moment in time. They can last for minutes, but compassion once it has been cultivated, it's there all the time. And it is involuntary when it gets to that point. So a lot of reasons for saying we should draw a difference. Now, there are two, there was a, in the old days, you must have learned this, Thacker, in the old days. He, he really, he's perpetually young. I said to him, it's like Dorian Gray. <laughs> Where do you keep the painting that shows your actual age? He looks just like he looked 25 years ago. Like he had something about the good life, or the good genes, at least. Um, why do we act compassionately towards anyone? Why do we do that? Darwin said, I'm not going to take time to read you the quote, but I did read it to him. And he said, that's exactly what I believe. Darwin said that when you see someone suffer, you suffer. You feel that pain. Remember Bill Clinton, I feel your pain? You actually suffer. So why do you act to relieve their suffering? Because it relieves your suffering. Okay? If you like a very selfish reason. Now, if you continue to suffer when you see suffering, and you are working in an occupation where there's a lot of suffering occurring, you're going to burn out. But I'll get to that in a moment. Now, the Buddhist view, this is the seed of compassion, the fact that witnessing another suffering makes you suffer. But there is another seed uh, of compassion, which they talk about, which is, and it is present really in all of us, it is the feeling we have for our immediate offspring. It is, we would do anything without thought to help them so they don't suffer. That's not something we learn, I don't believe. I say I don't believe because there's no controlled experiments on this issue. Uh, it's part of parenting, crucial to parenting. The issue is how do you extend that to the people around the globe? I'll come back to that. So, the taxonomy. First, I suggest that we distinguish emotion recognition. Just knowing how the other person feels. Uh, that's usually fairly easy. We've developed a tool, an online tool, that teaches people in an hour to be extremely good. It makes schizophrenics as good as normals in one hour. It makes salesmen get much better ratings three weeks later from their supervisors, from their fellow workers. It just makes you more in tune than you ordinarily are. It's the first step. It's the sine qua non, and it's easy to learn uh, or to get better than you are. But it doesn't mean you're going to be compassionate. A good torturer needs to have emotion recognition to know just how much pain to endure. Okay? But it's step one. Step two is resonance. 
Resonance means that you feel in your body what they feel. Now, there are two kinds of resonance. I'm a little hesitant because my wife is sitting right here, and I always use this as an example. But she's almost never in the room when I say it. But I never had any out because it's in the book. And I do say in the book, this didn't really happen. But it's something I made up. So this didn't really happen. Really do believe this didn't really happen. So my wife comes home one night, and she slams the door when she comes in. I say, what's the matter, honey? She says, that chancellor, he just won't give me the money for the graduate students that I need. And if I don't have the money for the graduate students, we won't get the best. And if we don't get the best, we won't keep the best faculty. What's wrong with them? I'm furious. OK, resonance. She's, my wife is feeling shame. This <laughs> now, I'll say again, this did not happen. I made this up. It's a book. I wanted an illustration. So two types of resonance. Resonance type one, I say. That rotten chancellor. How could he act that way? He, we should get rid of him. Let's get a recall. It's all right, the faculty. He shouldn't do that. Doesn't he know what he's doing? So I'm, I'm expressing and resonating to her anger. People love it when you resonate. <laughs> That's what we all want. Some of us pay people so that they will resonate. <laughs> but resonance type two. Oh, you poor baby. I'm so sorry you had to put up with that car. I don't know how you do it. Come on over here. I'll give you a massage. Or get, a, get you a glass of wine. I'm being resonant also, but not with the same emotion. That's just as good. Okay? And actually, for people in the healthcare professions who are dealing with a lot of suffering, it's a much better form of resonance. It's not going to burn you out. If you resonate, I had the misfortune of uh, having some abdominal surgery at UCSF. It would have been a misfortune at Cal Pacific, too. It wasn't that it was UCSF. <laughs> but what I wanted from the caregivers was not that they cried with me, that they felt my pain. I wanted them to care, to help me deal with it. I wanted them to be concerned. I wanted resonance type 2. OK, so emotion recognition. You don't have resonance if you don't know how the other person's feeling. But resonance is different from recognition, and it's different from compassion. Compassion is when you actually act to reduce the suffering of another person. Global compassion is what we saw with the tsunami. Without it being organized, many Americans gave money, sent food, did what they could to people of a different skin color, of a different religion, a different language group. That's global compassion. It's really what we need if the planet's going to survive. Uh, in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, we could just take care of our own and let everyone else be damned. Rugged individualism. But Al Gore, I believe, is right. If the, we're going to have a planet to our grandchildren that's in as good a shape as it was when it got handed to us, then we're going to have to recognize what the Buddhists talk about as the interconnectedness of all of us and the fact that we need to extend our concern for everyone. All right, one more. Heroic compassion. And there are two types. But in heroic compassion, you put your own life at risk. Okay? Now, the person who jumps into the subway to pull that person who fell out, or jumps into the uh, lake to rescue a drowning child, might drown himself. That's impulsive, unplanned, and most of us don't know whether we're capable of it. You only know that you're not capable of it if you're one of those people who stood on the subway platform and did nothing, who stood by the side of the lake. And what we do know is that most people don't act this way. Most are not heroic. There's a second type of heroic compassion, and it's most typified by 
Those in Europe who rescued Jews, putting not just themselves, but their family, sometimes their village, and it wasn't a single impulsive, it was a planned and often extended act. When you ask these people, I haven't done this, it's Christian Monroe, uh, a political scientist at Irvine who studied these people. You ask them, why did you do it? How did you make the decision? No decision, I had to do it. No choice, they're people. But all we know is that those people are rare who act heroically. What is it? How does it come into being? Can we inculcate it in others? Should we be trying to? Is that setting the bar too high? You're hearing some of the questions that I'm going to talk with them about, I hope, uh, this February. Before taking questions, let me close by quoting. That's from the back of the book. That's a favorite picture of mine. And uh, I suppose what I see in that picture is a emotion I don't have a name for. But I recognize it. And, it's, uh, and whenever I listen to this, that's how I feel. This is my time. You know? This book, I'm listening to part of the audio. So a good friend of my daughter's, who I only know as Radio Tanya, uh, she has a BBC program and a PBS program, and she did the only interview of the Dalai Lama and me, only publicity interview, and she asked us two questions, really good questions. Why would you spend 40 hours with this other person? And what did you get from it? So first I'll read you his answer and then mine. Now this is what he said. In modern times, sometimes, spiritu sometimes spirituality seems old-fashioned. So modern science is now something refreshing. But our interests are the same. The genuine good scientist really takes concern about humanity and humanity's problems, and particularly the scientist who deals with emotion. You see, he's very much concerned about that. So I felt that some joint effort, mainly from scientists, as these are modern gurus, gurus of modern times. I'm a Buddhist monk. I may be an old-fashioned guru. Once we start a conversation, there are many similarities, and I learn many things from modern scientists in the emotion field. Sometimes he has a larger vocabulary than we do. In the past, you see, I have confidence that as far as emotions and mental things are concerned, I think Buddhists have that kind of feeling. But now, after meeting with this old gentleman, he points to me, <laughs> he said he categorizes new words and new ideas and certain senses or emotions. It's very helpful. And similarly, hopefully, he also gets some useful information from my side. So that means good collaboration. So now here's my response. It was illuminating. It provoked me to think of things I would never have thought of, and I hope I provoked him. We had so much fun, but there was this common shared moral commitment. I do believe we've come up with practical ideas that people can use to improve their lives, and that's what we both want. Now, one of the areas that we completely agree about is that we need to see the world as it is. Very often, we see it as it is not, and we act in those terms. The emotions evolved for us to deal with small groups of people and terribly large animals who wanted to eat us. It's a system that works very well in that context, it's not where we are now most of the time. The emotion system, in my view, evolved in a way that didn't make room for awareness, and it didn't build in any fundamental wisdom. Most of us don't know what our mind is doing at the time it is doing it. Many people use the radio to avoid their mind. They get in the car, they turn on the radio. They go for a walk, they put on their headsets. They never allow themselves to just be with their mind. The very first step is to be with yourself, with your mind, to observe your mind. We live in a society of organized distraction, where most people, even when they go to bed, read a book until it falls out of their hands, take a pill so they'll fall asleep. We don't listen, observe, or become acquainted with our mind. There's a huge cost to being unfamiliar with your mind, particularly when it comes to emotion you're much more likely to enact emotions 
in a destructive way if you don't know what's going on in your own mind. It's a stranger. Can you imagine? Most of us are living with strangers, the stranger of our mind. That's the book. That's a CD in which you could hear another hour beyond what you already heard of the two of us talking mostly in English. Thank you very much. The Dalai Lama's claim that happiness is a skill and that self-discipline is your ability to kind of stay in that happy emotional state in spite of what may happen around you. Do you want to repeat that question? Do you want to hear that question? Or well, I can repeat it when I answer it. Uh, how do I, if you don't need to cultivate emotions, then how would I respond to the Dalai Lama's statement somewhere that happiness needs to be cultivated? Uh, I'm trying to abolish the word happiness. In my prayer book, Emotions Reveal, I distinguish 12 different enjoyable states. Uh, and the problem with the word happiness is we don't know which one it's talking about. But it also is, many times when we're talking about happiness, we're talking about a cognitive evaluation of our well-being, how we're doing in the world. Or we're talking about a personality trait, cheerfulness. Okay? Now, what the Dalai Lama is talking about is something called sukha. Now, if you don't, that is something we don't have an English word or concept for. It is your outlook on the world. And that, and it is an outlook that incorporates equanimity uh, and compassion. And it feels very good, but it's nothing like an emotion. Uh, and you have to work a lot to develop sukha. Most of us instead are cursed with dukkha. I don't want <laughs> to tell you what dukkha is, because we all deal with it every day. It's the exact opposite, so make it that way. So if you are going to cultivate a, the closest would be in English, equanimity and calmness, that's not given to us. That need, but sukha is a lot more than that. Next summer, at his request, I've organized a conference bringing together uh, scholars in Tibetan Buddhism and in the language Western Westerners in the language of mental life to try to remap in English some of these Tibetan Buddhist concepts, which are so badly expressed in the English single terms that we use. Um, when we taught last spring at Stanford a course recognizing facial emotions and we used um, met and set your techniques, everyone always recognized happy emotions and had a lot of difficulty with contempt and some difficulty with disgust. And you would talk about how do you improve your ability to recognize an impulse, an emotion, an impulse for awareness of <laughs> that you talk a little bit about in the book, a kind of um, how to develop awareness of an impulse before an action or something about that in relation to just needing, how to embody in some sense this awareness of an impulse. It came up a lot with the students. <laughs> uh, two different things that you're asking about. The first one, the easy one, is that the smiling face is the most easily recognizable uh, face of all. And of course it's the face that is totally different than the face that you see with any of the other emotions. And it involves an oblique action uh, and usually exposes teeth. And you get the contrast between lips and teeth makes it highly visible. So you don't need to teach people how to recognize happiness. You do need to teach them how to recognize the difference between politeness and genuine enjoyment. Most of us don't know how to do that. But that's learnable, too, if you really want to know. You might be better off not knowing. <laughs> now, your more difficult question is, since we can't, even the Dalai Lama agrees, getting into the appraisal itself, no, no chance. But the appraisal gives rise to an impulse. And between the impulse or the action, or in Buddhist terms, between the spark and the flame, before the behavior, but there's a gap there. If we could enter that, 
1957, God, it's a long time ago, I was a clinical psychology intern at Langley Porter Neuropsychiatric Institute. It used to be called the Langley Porter Clinic, a lot less pretentious in those days. Um, and my psychotherapy supervisor said, Paul, if you can increase the gap between impulse and action, you will have done an enormous amount for your patients. And what he should have added is, and nothing that I taught you will be of any use to you. <laughs> <laughs> now, in this new book, we do talk about specific exercises for doing it. But the Dalai Lama himself says, if I don't get to meditate for two or three days, I start to lose it. To me, that's without having statistical tests, that's evidence that this is something that is like being a concert violinist who needs to practice every day. If you don't practice every day, there's, it's not like learning to type or to ride a bicycle. You don't need to do that for 10 years, and then you can just do it again. But if you develop the awareness of impulses as they arise, and we both have exercises for doing that, described in the book, then you need to do them all the time. I don't mean 24 hours a day. I mean 15 to 25 minutes a day. And don't miss many days. Now, there are indiv some individuals. Uh, we're just about to publish something called an emotional profile, uh, which is an interactive graphic tool that allows you to distinguish the unique way in which you experience emotion. We all experience emotions differently, and I'll just talk about one of the features. My watch would like me to take a pill, but I will wait and not take it now. Uh, it's my minder. It's observing me all the time. Uh, some of us have a very steep onset. We realize from no emotion to quite intense emotion in less than a second. And some of us have a very gradual onset. It takes quite a while, sometimes minutes, for us to become emotional. Well, if you have a gradual onset, it's going to be much easier to learn these exercises. You're stuck, and you actually, you don't need to. I mean, you're already ahead of the game. It's the people with the steep ones. It's the attack dogs. Those are the ones who need to learn it. It's going to be much harder but there is some reason, increasing reason to believe, both from anecdote and from science, that these are learnable skills, but skills that have to be practiced to be maintained. You talk about the problem of the concept of sukha, which we don't have an English term for. Since many of our English terms don't have translations that are in any way exact, and some of the emotions we have, there is no English term for, like schadenfreude, okay? or nachas. The reason why you put up with the shit is because of the nachas you feel about the accomplishments of your offspring. Very important emotion, but we don't name it. It was named in Yiddish. Okay? So the fact we don't have a name for it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, contrary to the belief of many I'm uh, a psychologist. Uh, I know. I'm going to get to yours. Of course, I had to throw a stone or two. <laughs> Not at anyone sitting in this room. Uh, I don't think. Um, when I was doing research in New Guinea, uh, I used stories, short narratives. And I believe that's the only way. In this language conference, that's what we're going to be doing is coming up with a dozen short narratives that exemplify what you're talking about. Because narratives are understandable. M many of them are understandable in another uh, language setting. And certainly, cutting across industrial societies, it's, the narratives can work quite well. Uh, terms like anger, or fear, or compassion are a shorthand for a family of experiences that can only be captured by giving the narratives. And the Oxford English Dictionary does that to some extent, but not for going across languages. So I think that's the way. That's the only way uh, that we ever know that we're talking about the same thing. Uh, but of course, much of the time, we get into arguments because we're not talking about the same things. We think we are. 
but we haven't gone through the step first of finding out what is it we're really referring to. And even if we give a story, you know, when you came in last night so late and you woke me up and I couldn't fall back asleep, okay, well, my view of that story may be very different from the other person's view of that story. They may have a narrative that doesn't fit it exactly. You know, Grand Showman was the movie that exemplified the fact that we each have a different construction of how we see the world, but we can at least know which set of narratives we're talking about. Well, yes, Doctor. Uh, so, I feel like a lot of people in this room may be asking about compassion and what you think it is. If it's not an emotion, yeah. I think students in our emotion class might disagree, but I want to quote a couple of people who are Charles Darwin and, and the Dalai Lama. Charles Darwin, uh, The Descent of Man, stated that sympathy, uh, perhaps a little bit differently Passion, but close, if you look at his writings, is our strongest instinct and uh, really the foundation stone of human nature. The Dalai Lama, compassion is our basic nature. So that says that it's wired deep us into us. Uh, so what is that? Well, listen, there are a lot of things that are wired deeply within us that are not emotions. I mean, Darwin calls it an instinct. We don't use that term anymore for human behavior. Uh, but he really uh, I didn't read that quote to you, I should have. He says it's the highest moral virtue. Uh, that is compassion. Compassion, and he uses this phrase in Descent of Man, which really knocked the Dalai Lama out, that concern for all sentient beings is the highest moral virtue. And of course, that's the phrase that's used in uh, Buddhism, is concern and the concept for all sentient beings. But that's a moral virtue. Now, moral virtues are clearly not built into all of us. Uh, the wish to protect, the need, the impulse to protect your biological offspring, sometimes your intellectual offspring, not often enough in the academic world. <laughs> uh, that, I think, is built into us, too. But, you know, we have, there are many important, we have traits, we have attitudes, there's a wide variety of mental phenomena, all I'm really trying to do with this is to identify the ways in which compassion differs from other emotions, from what we consider to be the basic emotions. It's just not like them, and when you get it on a global level, then it's really different. Uh, so, I don't know that, you know, I, it would be really nice if one could think of three other mental states that share many characteristics with compassion. And I'll ask him what he thinks of that. But he now, incidentally, calls himself a Darwinian. And uh, he now ex he accepts the Darwinian explanation of human origins and the theory of evolution. But mostly he likes Darwin's uh, moral virtue position and his belief, you know, Darwin's belief that it is the need to reduce your own suffering that induces uh, compassion. That's really different from what induces fear or anger. So there's just many ways in which it differs. Now, you probably remember in the good old days of controlled psychology, they talked about levelers and sharpeners. And levelers like to see just a few categories. And sharpeners need to see many, many. He's a sharpener and so am I. So the more complexity, the better. So it's another I don't think it's a totally illuminated phenomenon of compassion, but I don't think we're going to get very far if we think of it as just like anger or fear. It is. It has unique properties. Given the concept that we're hardwired for compassion for our biological offspring, how do you explain honest feelings among a whole class of What a tough question. Did you all hear that? I hope you did. Yeah, how do you explain honor killings? Uh, we know that culture can override what many things that are built into us. Uh, let me give you an, a different example. I'm going to do what I call pulling a palin. Pulling a palin. <laughs> pulling a palin is when you answer a question that wasn't asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, I asked the Dalai Lama at one point, it's in the book, 
I said to her, walk up onto a hillside, because you see a man that's standing there, looks like he's holding a rifle. And when you get there, you see he's holding a Kalashnikov. And it's right above the children's playground. You say to him, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm waiting for the kids to come out so I can kill as many of them as I can. And you explain to him all the reasons why you shouldn't kill children. He says, but I enjoy this. You like, you do what you like. I'm going to do what I like. <laughs> okay, now you hear the bell ring. And you hear the sounds of children. They're about to come out the door. He brings his Kalashnikov up to his shoulder. What do you do, Dalai Lama? You pick up a stone and you hit him as hard as you can on his brain. And if you kill him, then you have saved him from terrible karma. It's an act of loving kindness. And there are many stories in Buddhist, you know, I should have known. I'm not going to present them with something that they haven't already thought about and thought about the answer to it. And that's the answer. The answer is, if you believe in reincarnation, that if you engage in terrible, cruel behavior, you're going to get punished so badly that if I can prevent you, even by taking your life, I've done you a favor. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is because it's an example of a cultural override against the impulse not to kill people. So I think what you're dealing with in your example is a cultural override where what they believe that they're doing is saving the family, not just one individual. It's very hard for us to comprehend, but I don't believe that we'll get very far if we start with a position that it, it's, a, it's a wrong act from our perspective. It isn't a viciously motivated act from the perspective of the person who does it. I say that without ever having met any of those people. But I think that that's at least a possibility that you're dealing with the impact of culture. I hope cultural anthropologists who tend to think of me as the devil, who gives nothing to culture, are listening to this fact that I'm giving an awful lot to culture, can override an awful lot that's built into us uh, in a number of ways. It'd be very interesting to know what the consequences are. You know, are there repercussions when you violate something that's so fundamental to the loyalty and within the family by killing a family member? So, it's a very tough issue, tough question. Joe Camille. I, I'm interested to know if the uh, Dalai Lama has, uh, during your conversations with him or elsewhere, possibly in his other talks or writings, referred to the promise of the study of physiology for understanding psychology or the things that he deals with at the emotional or compassion level. Uh, Joe Camillo was a professor at UCSF. I think for as long as I was, and uh, longer. Longer? <laughs> good, anyone in there longer? Um, a good 40. At least I was there before you. You were there before me. <laughs> he was there before me. Uh, and uh, did research on physiology and um, was very noted for biofeedback and sleep research. So Joe's asking, what's the Dalai Lama's attitude about physiology? Uh, he's fascinated by science and by the brain. And uh, I've tried to convince him, my own bias, that just to know that something lights up in the brain doesn't really get us very far. It's interesting, but it's not particularly useful for changing social behavior. Uh, not that I, we differ. I am a reductionist. That is, I don't think there's anything we do that isn't a product of the brain. And he thinks there is. He said to me, if you can convince me, if you could prove to me that when the brain is dead, there is no mind, I will no longer be a Buddhist. I said, not yet, but it's not too far away. Uh, probably not in our lifetimes. Uh, the, a question I asked him was, it takes a lot of work to develop this kind of skill to monitor impulses as they arise. If we could use biofeedback from the brain or from autonomic physiology and could speed that process up, what would you think of that? Wonderful. He doesn't care. What he wants you to do is to be more mindful of your own state. And whatever techniques will work, and if there are new techniques that will come from science, 
Bravo. So, you know, he's in, 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 in danger of being a little over seduced by these charts of different colors in the brain, which uh, I think they're interesting, but they so far haven't told us anything about how you become aware of the impulse before the action. You should get, I don't know if we all heard that, but it's really about what's the role of religion in either motivating or enabling uh, heroic compassion. Or is heroic compassion in and of itself evidence of a higher power? Uh, you should look at Christian, which is a spe spelled with a K, Monroe, spelled in the obvious way, uh, on the faculty at UC Irvine. Her book is called Altruism, and it's really the best piece of work we've had on these people who show heroic compassion, as well as philanthropists and other comparison groups. And her studies, and she has a pretty large sample, religious observance is totally unrelated to heroic compassion. You find it on people who have no religious belief, and you find it people who have religious belief. Now, I mean, the Dalai Lama and I drew a circle around what we were going to talk about. And uh, religion was not in the circle. Uh, it, it crept in, he says at one point with a huge laugh, like a spy. It's <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Uh, um, it crept in and then we put it aside because although he is a great expert on the religion, Tibetan Buddhist religion in particular, his version of it. I know nothing about religion, any religion, let alone that religion. And so it's not where our interests intersected. But you know, it, I couldn't resist that, including that little bit about atheism there. He has great respect for atheism. And he, he's not a proselytizer. He discourages Westerners from becoming Buddhists. Stick with your own traditions. I mean, if that's what you really have to do, then do it. But it's not something that's encouraged. So I think, uh, trusting Monroe's data, we would have to say that no, it is not, you know, there was no relationship between being observant and being religious. I did find in my own research on a totally different topic that more observant people are less likely to tell serious laws. But that's a different matter. Different yeah. uh, how do you see your work affecting governance, especially in dealing with groups of people throughout the world who are the most destructive? I couldn't get the last word. Groups of people who are most destructive. I think the part of what we discuss that's most relevant, there's a much longer discussion of forgiveness. There's a terrible example of a terribly cruel set of actions and why and how you forgive those actions in the section on forgiveness. Uh, but probably what's most relevant is there are about 12 pages on resentment. Resentment is what focuses you on the past and prevents you from dealing with the future. Whether that's in a marriage or in the relationship between national groups. It's at the heart, I think, of many of the problems in the Middle East, uh, in the uh, Balkans. Resentments that go back a long, long time. So we have a lot of discussion about what the nature of resentment is and how to overcome resentment. 
and uh, we don't have a panacea. But it's conceptually, it's the issue that's closest to dealing with world problems. Uh, that in the section on how to deal with very cruel people who act cruelly. Um, we really had a long, you know, not every German embraced Nazism and joined the SS. Only some did. Uh, some stood by and did nothing, and some were heroic rescuers. But what do you do about the people who embraced it and really were enthusiastic for buying it? My own belief is that emotions, understanding of emotions can be very helpful, that the emotion of disgust is the most dangerous emotion. It's the emotion of the Holocaust. When you feel disgust towards an individual or a group, then you just want to get rid of them. It's if you look at the writings of Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist, the Jews were lice, they were vermin, pollutants. It was all the language of disgust. So I think our discussion of disgust, Holocaust, and resentment is a little bit we have to offer to the question that you raised. It's just a little bit. Yeah, along those same lines, I, I was very uh, moved by an action that I believe you took uh, at the time of the Olympics, and you wrote a letter to the uh, Chinese government trying to, to explain to them reasons why they should you know, have honest, earnest discussions uh, with His Holiness. And I'm, is that correct? That's correct. So I'm interested to uh, hear more about the process that you went through making the decision, your emotional process. And well, that was a very easy one. I mean, I, I believe I've spent more time in one-to-one -one conversation with him than anybody in the last 20 years, perhaps forever. Uh, and I'm an expert on deception and on facial expression, so I felt I could say a lot about what this man is like. Uh, he's a man without guile. He's trustworthy and trusting perhaps to a fault. You know, he's, so I... Without hesitation, uh, I wrote that and uh, got published. And uh, and you can see that those negotiations have gone on, and the problem has been solved. <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, I'm still working on that through intermediaries. And uh, the and I hope that I might be able to be a first step. Meet. They're very distrustful. Now, they're a little less distrustful of him than the people around him. But for whatever reasons, the Chinese know my work and don't distrust me. So I might be a, it's such a long shot. But I feel you always have to take the long shots. They're there. What do you, you have to give it a try. And uh, I don't know enough about the politics of it. I do know that there are two very different stories about the history of China and Tibet. There are websites you can go and read both stories. And it's like Rashomon. And uh, I'm not a political historian. Uh, but the issue is to stop the cruelty at this point and to deal with this man while he is still with us. Because what comes next may be much harder to, to deal with. He enjoys a, you know, and uh, the only time I ever saw him get angry is when the uh, uh, Chinese accused him of fomenting the violence in Tibet about the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And he, how can they believe they can get away with that kind of lie? And uh, he threatened to resign his Dalai Lama unless they stopped being violent. Mm -hmm. That's how strongly he feels. And, but they stopped. Now there's a lot that are critical. I think, you know, there have been 12 years of negotiations between his brother who just died and Chinese representatives got nowhere. It's only gonna, it's going to take a face-to-face -face meeting. He met face-to-face -face when he was a teenager with Mao and Chow and Lai. There's some unbelievable photographs. And he totally trusted them, and they totally betrayed him. You know, it's, if people totally trust you, in the rules of politics, if you can get away with it, then betray them. But there's some cost to it, so maybe there's a possibility. <coughs> Practical things you can do to let go of resentments. 
part of it, I'll give you his answer. It would be again and again taking the object of your resentment and focusing loving kindness, wishing well. It's very hard to do. I mean, yeah, it's easy to say, and extremely hard. But you can begin, if you really work at it, you'll find that you can begin to soften that attitude. Now, I think there's a much more cognitive reframing, that you can take things from cognitive behavioral therapy and use that to apply to resentments in a useful way. And so that's a totally Western approach. These approaches are like hand and glove. They fit together very, very nicely. Uh, can be done. So there's a bit about that, although this is not primarily a, a technique book, but it does at least get started on saying what are the things you could try. Oh, we have time for one more question. You pick. <laughs> The, the question is, uh, am I mentioning that with compassion, truly really with resonance, or uh, compassion that is totally based on resonance, that uh, there would be burnout? His answer to that, and this we talk about a lot, and I use the example of a nurse who works on an oncology ward, a child oncology ward, and is seeing children suffering and dying all the time. Now, with practice, over time, you can move from resonance one to resonance two. He loved that distinction. He loves distinctions. He can now explain a lot of things he couldn't explain before with that distinction. So there's, you move from one type of resonance to the other, and then with practice, and when I say practice, I mean a particular meditative practice. You then get to the point where someone else is suffering. You feel it very slightly for a moment or two. What you feel is this involuntary need to be of help to them. So you have to get to that point. But the step, first step along the way is stop resonance one, getting angry at the chancellor and get into the poor baby resonance two mode. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with all the trouble you've got. And I can help you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much.